Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians and chapter number 16. The book of 1 Corinthians and chapter number 16. We have been going through the book of 1 Corinthians and we're now on our final chapter. That we've been walking through this book and watching as the Apostle Paul has spent a lot of effort to correct the many mishaps of the church of Corinth. That this church has been known by its pride, that they've been puffed up. And that because of their pride, they've allowed sins and misuse of spiritual gifts and this and that and the other all throughout. And the Apostle Paul has been correcting the behavior bit by bit by bit. Now as he hits to chapter number 16, he has just finished off a major chapter of the resurrection, speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, that we're going to be raised up, that we're going to get brand new bodies. And now in this chapter, he's now closing things down and beginning his salutations that as I finish this up, he says, I still love you. I care for you. Here's some things to keep and remember until I get there. Notice with me as we see this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and notice with me in verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them <coughs> will I send to bring to your liberality into Jerusalem. And if it be me that I go also, they shall also or shall go with me. Now I will come or unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16? The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and notice with me in verse number 2, where it says, upon the first day of the week. Upon the first day of of the week. And with the Lord's help, we're just going to take these verses here and just see some of the things that happen within a local church upon the first day of the week. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God, a God worthy to be worshiped and worthy to be served. And as we come to you now, we're just asking that you would give us grace and that you would give us mercy. Help this passage to be understood. Help us to be able to see what you are doing in our lives, how you're drawing us close, and that what plans that you have for us. And help us to once again see that within a local church, the things that can be accomplished within the assembling together to move your work forward, to move things and advance them for what you've given us to do. And we love you. Thank you again for you being a wonderful God. In your name we pray. Amen. Upon the first day of the week. Now, the Apostle Paul has previously already spoken a little bit about 
the fir- principle of the first day of the week. And we're going to have an entire message on the first day of the week a little bit later to try to explain. But just as a quick background, not as a full explanation, but as a quick background, we know for the Hebrew people, they had set aside what was called the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the last day of the week. We now call that Saturday. So the Jewish people traditionally put apart Saturday. In fact, it was part of the Ten Commandments that we are supposed to take the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And it's going to be a very important principle. Later on, when God is giving the plans for the um, tabernacle and he's giving them to Moses, he spent 40 days with Moses giving the tabernacle. And then God says, time out before you go back. Let me give you something. And God gives him a special name, uh, gives himself a special title and announces to Moses that God is the God that sanctifies you. But then he gives a principle with that name that he says, what's going to happen? It's going to take nine months to build the tabernacle. And there's going to be a temptation that you will spend those nine months doing so much for me that you fail to spend time with me. And he says, don't forget the Sabbath. And we could see that the laws always put a great emphasis on the Sabbath. Remember that it's not the day itself that was the critical issue as much as it is the principle. The principle was is that God doesn't want us to get so busy doing things for him that we fail to spend time with him. Now, today in the New Testament church, God has given us a different day. And we could prove that all throughout scripture. That's not the purpose of this lesson here. Even though we're going to have an entire message on it soon where I'll lay out that groundwork. But God is the one who changed it from the Sabbath day to what we would call the first day of the week or the Lord's day. So much so, it was so established that when Paul or John is writing in the book of Revelation, he says, I was in the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's day. It was such an understood saying that every church knew what day it was. It was the first day of the week. It was Sunday. It was already established by then. Again, I'm not laying all the groundwork done. I'm just giving a principle that it was God that changed it. We're not arguing the point. We are saying as an established thing that the Apostle Paul said, I'm going to come on the first day of the week. And these are the, some of the things that are going to happen. And I'm expecting when I assemble with you on the first day of the week, which we can see that the church of Corinth had already planned on assembling on the first day of the week. Our purposes, we want to examine 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. And I want to point out three different things that happen within a local church on the first day of the week. Some three different things that, can ha- that happen in a local church on the first day of the week. Notice, if you don't mind, the very first thing is that storehouse giving is practiced. Storehouse giving is practiced. Notice if you don't mind in verse number one, chapter 16 in verse number one. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Now let me pause here to give some context. That the churches, <laughs> um, uh, there was a disaster that happened in Jerusalem. And the Apostle Paul very much cared for those Jerusalem saints. And so earlier he had announced that he would like to do something for the, the church, uh, church in Jerusalem and the saints that was there. And the church of Corinth was the very first one to raise their hand and say, Hey, Paul, we'll help you out. Whatever you need, we'll get an offering. We'll get it together and we'll help you out. Well, Paul got so excited about, man, these people responded well. They responded great. Paul went to Galatia and he said, hey, I'm going to plan up collecting this uh, collection for the saints to help these saints that are out. And then the church of Corinth, they said they're all in. They said, this is what they're going to do. I mean, this is exciting. And the church of Galatia, who was very poor, said, oh, well, we want to help out. What can we do? And they took their time to pray and they took their time to 
turn, give themselves to the Lord and say, God, whatever you would like us to do, we want to help out. And so they did something. They got excited. So Paul went to Philippi and he said, man, I want to do this collection of the saints. I believe this is what the Lord would have us to do. And the church of Corinth, they said they're all in. They said they're going to give us some money. They're going to take care of things. The churches of Galatia, they were so excited that they already gave us some money and we're fixing to go over and we're going to deliver this. And the church of Philippi said, oh, man, we want to get on board. Meanwhile, the church of, um, of Corinth gave goose egg. Nothing. And Paul's like, what is, wait a second. In fact, he's going to go over this in 2 Corinthians where he said, listen, I've been bragging about everyone I see about what you told me you were going to do. And now you've given nothing? That's a horrible testimony. I mean, I've, I've been bragging on you. I'm, you. I expect you to keep your word. I'm not trying to twist your arm, but this is what you said you were going to do. So this is what Paul is referring to in the book of 1 Corinthians 16 is that you said you were going to give a collection. I expect you to keep your word. He's not trying to twist their arm. He's not trying to make them give something they're not willing to give. He's just saying, this is what you said you're going to do. I've already gone to Galatia. I've already gone to Philippi. They've already given an offering. I plan on going to Jerusalem. This is a time for you to keep your word. And when I show up, does it make sense? So that's kind of the context. Notice if you don't mind in verse number two. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay up by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings where I come. What he's giving is a principle that's found all the way in the Old Testament, continues in the New, about storehouse giving. If you don't mind, let's go back to the Old Testament. We're going to hold our finger here. We're coming back here. But turn with me to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. In Malachi chapter number three. Malachi chapter number three. So right before Matthew. So if you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just turn the other direction. Malachi chapter number three. The idea of storehouse giving is how God has chosen to supply for his house. Now, we know that the idea of God's house is changed definitions from the tabernacle to the temple to today to the church to the household of God. This is how God has worked. But God has also designed how to finance his work in the world. May I remind you that as a local church, we do not collect money from the government as a local church, we don't collect money from other churches, that God has designed it so God's house should be self-sustaining, self-autonomous, self-supporting. How does God design this? How does this work? The principle of storehouse giving. Notice with me in the book of Malachi chapter number three. Now in the book of Malachi, the people of Israel have returned back to Jerusalem, but it didn't take long for them to start disobeying God's word. And God sends the prophet Malachi to try to shoo them back in and trying to say, listen, you need to be uh, not hypocrites. You need to be consistent about your walk. Notice with me in the book of Malachi chapter number three, and notice with me in verse number eight. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. It says, will a man rob God? Now that's a big accusation. They respond, yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? So this idea of rob is a big definition. There is a difference between rob and steal. If I steal something, I'm trying to do it sneakily. I'm trying to do it in a way that I'm not caught. If I steal something from my mother's purse, I try to sneak in when mom's not looking and I take it. Now, you understand the principle. I'm not stealing from my mom's purse, right? But you know, I do it so I'm not caught, right? It's sneaky. I'm trying to be subtle about it. The difference between stealing and robbing is the idea of robbing is open and I don't care. Everyone can see me, give me this now. We have bank robbers. They're not doing it subtly. They go in there with guns, mask, give me all your money. Put it in the bags, everyone to the floor. That is robbing. It is open. It is apparent. Well, here the accusation says, ye have robbed God. Well, the people looked up and said, what do you mean we robbed God? How, I, how did we rob God? And he says, by your tithes and 
offerings, tithes and offerings. Well, what is a tithe? The word tithe literally carries the idea of 10%. That the Hebrew people were asked to give 10% of their wages and give to the Lord's house. They were to give it into store. The idea of offerings goes above and beyond the 10%. In fact, the 10%, according to Old Testament law, had already belonged to God. You don't give a tithe, you bring the tithe. There's a difference in wording. You bring the tithe. That's already God's. An offering comes from the 90% that you have. And so you give that uh, above and beyond that. Now notice what happens. Verse 9, ye are cursed with a curse. Why? For ye have robbed me. That means these people were asked to give 10%. That that 10% already belonged to God. But they didn't want to give it to God. And God said, you've robbed me. You took it from me openly. That was mine. That wasn't yours. You have the 90%. That 10 was mine. And you robbed me. You took my 10. You took my money and used it for yourself. You robbed me. Because of that, you're cursed with a curse. Then notice in verse number 10. Bring ye the tithes. Notice it doesn't say give ye the tithes. Bring ye the tithes. Means there's an assembly there. You bring the tithes into the storehouse. There's the principle of the storehouse. What happens at the storehouse? That there may be meat in my house. So this principle here is that the Hebrew people were supposed to bring the 10% and bring it to God's house. God would use that 10% to finance the temple to finance and take care of the, the priest and the people who are working it to make sure that they were taken care of. This is how God has designed it to run. Well, the same principle applies within the church. Because we don't get money from the government, because we don't get govern, uh, money from other churches, we don't get grants, we don't get anything else. The only way that we support this local church is by the faithful, voluntary giving of God's people. And when people bring it to the storehouse, then what happens is that we use it to pay the electricity. We use it to pay the preacher a little bit of a salary. We use it to get tracks. We use it to have the uh, internet, to be able to have the computers run. We be able to use it to uh, pay for the water bill. Those things are kind of important, right? Yes. Uh, and so we use it to finance the things going on God's house. We bring it to store, and from that storehouse, God uses it to pay the other thing. Well, that makes sense. God has designed it so we don't have to depend on the government. We don't have to depend on anyone else. Why is this important? Because of the golden rule. You're like, I know the golden rule. I was taught that in Sunday school. Here's the golden rule. He has the gold, makes the rules. So whoever finances things is whoever tells us what to do. So if we got money from the government, the government has the right to tell us what to do. If we got money from a different church, well, that church should have some right of what happens to the money that's given to us. God has designed it so that his church has to look at him for answers. He's the one that provides it by using the voluntary people. He's the one who tells us how to spend it, what to do with it. We get direction from him. Now, that's a wise God, so that way we don't have any interference from any other outside of organization. That Jesus Christ is our head, he tells us what to do. Does that make sense? That's how God has designed it, to try to finance his own work through his voluntary giving of his people, to give it into store. Now, notice what God says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring ye the tithes of the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Then notice what God says. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. In the Greek or in the Hebrew, that means I double dog dare you. I double dog dare you. I prove me. Put me to the test. See... If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God says, if you bring your tithes, if you bring your offerings and you put them in store, that means not giving to the American way. Now, you can give to those other things, but God is saying specifically to his house, that you make sure you don't neglect his house. He says, I double dog dare you, prove me, put me to the test to see if I will not pour out the blessing. Now, this does not state that if you give $5, God's going to give you 50. But God has already proven what God can do. The people in Israel, they, their shoes didn't wear out. You know how amazing that is? 
for those who have parents, we understand how important that is. All of my kids seem like they hulk out their shoes every now and again, right? And you have to go buy new shoes. Shoes are expensive now. The children of Israel, their clothes didn't wear down. They didn't have Walmarts to go to. And God let their clothes last longer. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't clothes expensive? You know what God can do is he can make your gas in your car last longer. He can make your car, your tires last longer. Isn't that a blessing? He can help your car not to need as many repairs as it could. He can let and protect you from health things. Isn't health bills pretty expensive? Imagine if God isn't giving you a blessing, how many more health bills we could have. Now, understand that it's not necessarily a tangible thing that if you give $5, God's giving you 50. But the blessings of the Lord are a lot more substantial. And God could do a lot more. And he says, I double dog dare you. I prove you. My home pastor used to give this thing. He says, I double dog dare you to start tithing faithfully. And if you're not better off next year than what you were this year, he says, I'll give you your money back. (gasps) How can you give a blank check? check like that? Because God did. He said, I double dog dare you. (laughs) My... um, Wife knows of a church in Arizona where there's a lady there who hates the pastor. Can't say anything nice about the pastor. Hates the church. Hates the people in it. But she sends her tithe every month. People are like, but you say all kinds of bad things. Why do you keep your tithe? You don't even go to that church. Yeah, but God blesses the tithe and he keeps blessing me. God said, prove me. Double dog dare you. See if it doesn't work. You could put him to the test. All right, God, this crazy preacher said, I'm supposed to bring the tithes in the storehouse and that see the blessing. I'm going to go see if it works. By the way, our church folks here who regularly give, all of them can say, you know what? God's blessed. I, they can tell stories. They can see what God has done. It's amazing what God can do. God blesses. You put them to the test. Notice, but that's not all. He says, I'll pour out a blessing to you that there should be not enough room to receive it. Verse number 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. We know the devourer is another name for Satan. God can keep Satan away from you and your family. Isn't that a big deal? He says, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. The idea of the fruits is things that come from us. This carries the idea of the things that we physically labor for. Man, I'd hate to work really hard and watch everything I work for just poof and go. Wouldn't that be horrible? But you know, it also carries the idea of our children too. The fruits of our labor. Didn't we invest in our kids and watch them? If we carry out this promise and let God work, God can even watch over our children. Isn't that a big deal? Absolutely. And so here is a promise... But again, why? Does God need your money? No, but you need his blessing. But this is how God has chosen. There's no such thing as a money tree. There's no such thing as I wake up one morning and there's money falling down from here. How does God finance his thing? By human instrumentality. He uses people who says, I believe this is what God's given me to do. I obey the Lord and God not only blesses me, but he uses what we give to finance what he is doing. Isn't that amazing? It's almost like God knew what he was doing. And the idea in 1 Corinthians 16 is that Paul is saying, I want you to continue to practice this storehouse. That on the first day of the week, you collect an offering to put into store to be used as God sees fit. The idea of storehouse giving is practiced on the first day of the week. What else is practiced through the first day of the week? Notice if you don't mind as we go back to 1 Corinthians 16. We can see something else. People are trained for the Lord's service. On the first day of the week, people are trained for God's service. Notice with me in chapter 16, verse number 3. Chapter 16 in verse number 3. And when I, that's Paul, come, whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be me that I go also, they shall go with me. So this is what Paul is saying. Hey, by the time I get there, this is what I want you to do. Is I want you to have men that you can trust. People that you have confidence in. People that you have your letters. These are kind of letters of recommendation. Meaning they've been evaluated. They've been proven. They're they're your trust. And I want them to take the offering. He says, I'm going to take my hands off. I want you to have accountability. I want these men to take the offering that you give, and they're going to make sure that it's delivered to the right place. Now, 
They happen to be traveling with me. So not only do they go, but they get to spend time with me. Now, what's going to happen with the Apostle Paul? You think he's going to use this and just kind of give them the silent treatment? He's going to be training them. What an opportune time. He said, I want you to take your men and I want people that you have confidence in, people that you trust and people that you want to learn from me. And I want you to have them ready. They're going to take your offering, not me. They're going to take your offering and we're going to go together and I'm going to train them. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to walk down the path. I'm going to give them more equip. We need more workers anyways. And they're going to be able to go back to your church and be able to help out. There's an idea of principle of training people and that we should always be training people to serve in the ministry, that everyone has a role to play, that the Christian life is not a spectator sport. Everyone has a role to play. Everyone has a job to do. Everyone's important. Everyone has something they can do. And maybe you say, well, this is what I like to do, but I'm not trained yet. Praise the Lord. We love training here. We love equipping people. This is why on Wednesdays, we have a teacher's workers meeting. Before a Wednesday night service, we meet together and we try to train people how to teach a Sunday school class, how to go soul winning, how to work. On 930 on um, Saturdays, we meet together and we do a soul winning clinic where we train people how to knock on doors, how to talk to people, how to win them to the Lord, how to work with them. We have Monday night evening school of the Bible where we're trying to train people to have a biblical worldview and understand. We're trying to constantly work with people, try to let you know that you have a part to play. And on the first day of the week is a day where you get to do some of the things where we have Sunday school class, we have ushers, we have people, we're trying to train and work with people that you have a role to do and that you can be a part of what God is doing in here. That it's not a spectator sport, it's not a one man show, that it's something that everyone can do something. And we want to train and equip them together. Could you imagine what a great uh, opportunity that would be to travel with the Apostle Paul? to ask him questions, to have that encyclopedia book of knowledge. And Paul's not a type of guy that says, listen, leave me alone. He's like, oh, you got a question? Let's talk about it. In fact, he's probably a little bit like me where you ask him a yes or no question and he asks, answers it in 30 minutes. I mean, and, but you're like, oh man, this is great. Let's write it down. Let's go. Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures. Remember, we showed you last week where the apostle Paul had... Um, went to the church of Jerusalem. And after uh, Barnabas walked with him, Peter and Paul began to take a tour of the Holy Land. And that Peter would be able to go, hey, this is where Jesus did this and Jesus did this. And Paul said, this is what the Bible says about this. This is what the Bible said about that. Could you imagine being in that class to follow behind Peter and Paul and just, wow, this is amazing. Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures. He was personally discipled by the Lord. God had used him to pen 14 books of the Bible and influence two others. This is someone who just asked questions to learn from. What a great uh, uh, privilege some of these people in the church of Corinth would had to be able to travel with Paul, to learn from him. What happens in the first day of the week? We gather up for storehouse giving. What happens in the first day of the week? It's an opportunity to train people and encourage them to find their place in the Lord's work. Notice there's a third thing here that people are taught about fellowship, uh, following the Lord's will. That on the first day of the week, people are taught about following the Lord's will. Notice as the apostle Paul continues on in verse number five. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey, whithersoever I go. Now Paul had designs But he also had the ability to allow God to change his plans. Paul originally planned to spend the winter at the church of Corinth. Remember that this is the ancient world that snow and winter shut down everything. And he says, you know what? It'd be great if I could spend the winter with you guys, fellowship with you. Let's catch up. Let's fix some things. Let's do that. That's my plans. Now we know in history, according to 2 Corinthians, this didn't happen. In fact, later on, the church of Corinth, there's going to be some of the naysayers that said, Paul keeps saying he's going to come here, but these things keep going. Paul just can't be trusted. But Paul is taking time to teach and said, this is my plans, but God has every ability to change my plans. God's plans are more important than mine. Notice as he goes on in verse number seven. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, If the Lord 
permit. Notice this. He gave himself, this is my plans, but it's God who's able to change things. It's God who's able to change the plans. I'm telling you that God's will is the one that decides everything. Not my will, not your will, God's will. And that God's will is able to direct us. However, he sees fit. God's will settles it all. Notice as he goes on in verse number eight. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. He says, I'm settling here. Remember, he's writing from Ephesus. He spent three years there. He's running a Bible institute. All of Asia has heard. Other churches have started, such as uh, Lady Osea and... Um, and Colossae. They have both been started not by Paul, but by church people who went to his Bible Institute there in, in Ephesus. And he says, I want to stay here. I, I want at least till Pentecost. I still want to try. Now, of course, we know those plans changed. What happened? Well, the silversmith people over at the temple of Diana, Lambeau Field, I mean, um, <laughs> they were upset that no one was coming on Sundays anymore to buy their football, I mean, their, their little trinkets and whatnot of their temple of Diana. And they got so upset that they had a meeting and for two hours they're shouting, great is Diana of Ephesus. And now that they're all stirred up, now they want to go kill Paul. And so Paul had to leave town. So he says, I was planning on staying there to Pentecost. We know in history, well, that didn't work out. God's will is able to settle things all. We don't have to be shaken. We can make plans. We can do our best to organize. But when it's all said and done, we can trust God's will. God knows what's best. In fact, notice what he says. Verse number nine is going to be key. Notice with me verse number nine. For a great door and effectual is open to me. Notice what he said. He says, while I'm here at Ephesus, there's a great door that's open and it's effectual. It's effective. Again, he's there at Ephesus for three years, running a Bible institute. And during this time, all of Asia, or heard, Asia here we know is Asia Minor, now known as Turkey. He says, while I'm here, I'm training these people. These people are taking what I'm teaching. And all of Asia has now heard the gospel. Doesn't mean everyone's saved, but everyone heard the gospel. There are churches being started. He says, God has opened a great door and it's effectual. It's effective. God's working. By the way, if I was Paul, I wouldn't want to leave either. If you're watching God really start working, I want to be where God's working at. But God knew what he was doing. Notice the next word, and. And there are many adversaries. Some people like to put these two sentences differently. There's a great door open to me. There are adversaries. And they like to try to put it, well, I'm trying to do something from the Lord, but these adversaries are trying to get in the way. But notice the word and. It doesn't say but. It says and. It says there's a great door opened and there are many adversaries. We understand from this that the many adversaries come with that open door. That if you're following the Lord's work, you should expect the adversaries. They are a part of it. They're a part of what God is doing to help the work go forward. That God is using the adversaries. That's part of his will. Someone says, well, I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want anyone to not like me. Well, then do nothing, say nothing, or be nothing. But as long as you want to be used of God, you should expect people to be upset with you. If you're trying to do something for the Lord, say something for the Lord, be something for the Lord, you will have adversaries. That's part of it. Jesus made a promise that was repeated in the Apostle Paul that all that's, uh, that uh, shall live godly shall suffer persecution. That's as much as a promise as John 3, 16. There's a great door open and there are many adversaries. That comes with it. But that's part of God's will. We don't have to be saying, well, Satan's really fighting against me today. Think about the people in World War II, the paratroopers. When they were <laughs> working out and running up the hills with a full pack, they weren't saying Adolf Hitler's really fighting against me today. No, they were saying we're training so we could win the war. Adolf Hitler didn't want them to train at all. He wanted them weak and flabby. He wanted them where they didn't have enough stamina or energy to get the job done. Satan does not want you to be spiritually strong. But how do you get spiritually strong? By adding more weight, just like lifting. Add a little bit more weight, a little bit more weight. These adversaries come to help you trust the Lord more so you could trust God for more. There are many open doors and effectual and 
There are many adversaries. It comes with it. If you are going to do something from the Lord, God has to help keep you spiritually strong. So the more that you try to do something for the Lord, the more you can expect more resistance. So you have more opportunities to trust God for more. This is part of the process. It goes with it. Paul's understanding this and he is teaching them that, listen church, you need to follow God's will. You can make all your plans and there's nothing wrong with planning. But you need to allow God to change your plans. You need to allow God to not throw a fit. You don't need to break down everything time something doesn't go your way. God knows what he's doing. And if you want to try to do something for the Lord and do something great, expect adversaries. But the adversaries are not in the way. They are part of what God has given to you so you could trust God more. So you're not depending on yourself. If we could do it ourselves, we would. If we could do it in our own strength, we would. But we can't do God's work our way and our strength. It has to be done by God. And God puts the adversary so we're forced to trust in him. Of course, many people in here know that we're praying for an impossible prayer. Next year, I'm going to encourage you guys now. Next year, the NFL draft is coming to Green Bay. Traditionally, 300,000 people come to a draft. Right now, the draft is starting to happen in uh, Detroit. Woohoo! They're getting prepared for it. They already got Green Bay officials over there to study for them. So 300,000 people are coming to our area. Our goal is that we want to pass out 100,000 John and Romans in three days time. In order for that to be done, we've got a local press who's working with us, but it's going to cost $30,000 to get the John and Romans. Well, we look at our church and go, well, that's impossible. I know, but we're praying for it anyways. But you know, we could pray for that and watch that happen and go, yay. In order to get 100,000 John and Romans passed out, that's 4,000 an hour that has to go. Now, of course, we're encouraging other churches within the state to come join with us. Part of our meeting next, um, at the end of the month, is to tell them about this, to try to plan and organize. Great. But we should also be planning for adversaries. Not everyone's going to be happy that we're going out there but we're going to try our best and we're going to try to do something for the Lord. You say, what happens if it fails? Well, praise the Lord. We tried something for the Lord, Amen. but it's up to him. But let's try something impossible. But I'm trying to encourage you folks, expect the adversaries, but we're going to go forward anyways, trusting that God can use those adversaries to get his work accomplished for the furtherance of the gospel. God knows what he's doing. Part of what we do in the first day of the week is that we try to teach people about the Lord's will and explain how the Lord's will works. The Lord's will is not when everything is easy. Lord's will is when we have to depend and trust on God, where we say, God, you do this or it doesn't work. God, you do this or it's not going to happen. God, we're trying something for you to honor you. And if you decide to change it all, that's fine. You are the boss. We don't have to kick the tires and be mad. We don't have to be upset if something doesn't work out right. We're going to trust the Lord. Whatever he sees fit. That's just an example. But praise the Lord. This is important teaching about the Lord's will. God has full dominion to change our plans. No problem. That we can have all the greatest plans and intentions we want, but God knows what's best. And when we're trying to do something for the Lord, expect the adversaries. They're going to come. Who knows? It won't be the first time I've had protesters outside of a church. It won't be the first time that I've had city governments not happy with us. It's not going to be the first time that we're going to have people who are going to do other stuff. Now, who knows? It may be the glorious time ever and we have no problems, but I said don't count on it. <laughs> we're expecting hiccups. We're expecting logistical problems. Remember, there's no hotel rooms left. We're going to have people sleeping in the church in sleeping bags here. We're going to have a bus, a couple buses that we're borrowing from another church to help transport them from here to Green Bay and from First Bible to Green Bay, probably from Appleton to Green Bay. We've got a lot of things. We've got to feed all those people somehow. You never think there's ever going to be problems trying to feed people? There's going to be all kinds of things. But we're going to try it anyways. You're like, Pastor, the more you talk about it, the more it sounds like a headache. I know. 
Guess who has got the biggest headache? <laughs> but these are things we should expect and not be upset and say, well, it wasn't easy. I'm quit. We're trusting God. We're going to watch God work. And it may work in such a way that we wouldn't even expect. We said, well, I didn't expect it. this happen. Who knows? You don't want to know what goes on in my mind. Wouldn't it be wonderful? It never happened. We did this, did a great offer, and people said, hey, you know what? We were closing down our church building. You want this church building in Green Bay? Wouldn't it be wonderful? I know that's impossible. But couldn't it be that God does something in such a way that he says, I was trying to get you here to open up this door for you. It would have never happened if we didn't go through the hardships and the adversaries and the thing. We can trust God for the furtherance of the gospel, for the faith of the gospel. Let God do what he's doing. So on the first day of the week, we understand that we collect for storehouse giving and collect an offering to be able to use to finance God's projects. During the first day of the week, we're trying to train workers and trying to enlist them, trying to equip them, trying to help them to continue. And the first day of the week, we're trying to remind people about God's will, that God has final say, and that when we're trying to do stuff, there's going to be adversaries. But we're going to keep trusting in God and depending upon him to equip to go out together and watch God work. It's all about God. It all begins with God. It all ends with God. God is the goal. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.